I can account for five minutes of it, driving down the road, oh, I forgot my hearing aids, and turn around and go back. When you're young, you're all one piece, right? And then as you get older, there's, there's bits of you that need to be added for you to function properly. Thankfully, it's only hearing aids. Oh, and a phone. Well, that, there we go, there we go. Ooh, ooh. The, uh, can, you, can you back up a couple slides so you can see my impressive slides that weren't available? Like, that, there's my, my modern ideology slide. See the Chinese communist hope? See how beautiful the future is? And strong and good we are? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and uh, maybe there was one before that. It was very, no, one before that? No. It was the next one? Well, there's Francis Bacon, for what it's worth. Anyway, I think that's it. That's it. So we'll go back to the, uh, the, the, the uh, recap. Salted pork? No, he doesn't have that uh, to his credit. <laughs> you would think, though, right? But the Earl of Sandwich, I believe, invented the sandwich. I think. <clears throat> or they named it after him. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> now, since you mention it. So, uh, before beginning with this, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, the, again, this glorious day, for your Sabbath day, uh, for the day of rest and worship. And Father, we pray that you would uh, bless us in this hour as we consider our world, understanding it, in which we labor, in which we sojourn, in which we minister. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The, uh, 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 by way of bringing up what came up during the week, uh, relevant to our, to our studies, and you can imagine things come up during the week. We're talking about the post-Christian world. Features of the post-Christian world pop up. And, uh, and I bring them to your attention. I don't have a slide for it. We're seeing more and more overt Satanism in society, particularly in the elites. Uh, again, post-Christian society put all that superstition and stuff behind us. Let's all just be scientific and rational and forge into a beautiful future. And then what pops up? Satanism, as well as paganism and Islam and all these other things. Um, <clears throat> in uh, World Magazine, Jordan Baller, who was with the Acton Institute, uh, published a column on uh, uh, taking Satanism seriously. And he says, there's a, he cited a guy named Bender Bones, B-E-N-D-R. Bones. A Satanist minister. It's funny how they call them ministers, which is a Christian word, meaning servant, right? But uh, uh, no, a, Christ, a Satanist minister slated to give the invocation at the Ottawa County Commissioner's meeting in Michigan. Says... The group is about terrestrial ideals and values, not religious doctrine. Balor, quote, oh, so Balor is quoting this guy. Uh, we are advocates for critical thinking, pluralism, compassion for some reason, empathy, conforming our beliefs to scientific understanding, the struggle for justice, he says. Baller goes on, uh, Satanists typically deny belief in an actual, literal Satan. Their devotion is instead to the high-minded ideals of progressive social justice. So why this Satan overlay, one wonders. 
For Satanists, the devil is, well, he answers the question. The, the devil is merely a symbol of the eternal rebel. Really, grow up. Against traditional religions, instead of supernatural belief, Satanists purport to, quote, promote pragmatic skepticism, rational reciprocity, personal autonomy, our subject today, and curiosity. Satanists use the cover, this is Balor again, Satanists use the, color of the cover of religious belief to undermine religion itself, just as evil is ultimately derivative of and dependent on good, parasitic. Oh, and then he uses the word Satanism is parasitic on Christianity. So, names in the news. Uh, but again, this would only happen in a post-Christian society. Uh, not a pre-Christian society. In a post-Christian society. And this is what you get. <coughs> so, that, uh, just leaving that there, just uh, let's recap. The post-Christian world introduced one, a different metaphysics, what we may call an empty sky, uh, two, what we looked at last week, a different heart. Perfection of this earthly life. Human power over nature, uh, perf uh, conquest of nature, uh, make the world do what we want it to do instead of being pushed around by the forces of the world. Now, this is progress. And today we'll look at a different morality. It comes with a different morality, namely personal autonomy moral progress in particular, not just technological progress, scientific progress, but moral progress, um, with no God and an earthly hope comes a very different ethic. Uh, so <clears throat> you, we know this from the way we speak of progress. Next slide, please. There you go. What? What I like about this picture is Woody's face. <laughs> Progress! Oh! <laughs> He's not so keen on progress. <laughs> anyway, it's a meme. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what we, the way we speak of progress, it's not only scientific and technological progress, it's also a progress in morals. We've progressed since then. You know the phrase, right? There could be no post-Christian anything, post-Christian movement, post-Christian development without the cult of progress to capture our hearts and displace the Christian. So people were, it was a Christian society. People took Christian things for granted. Everything was centered around Christian beliefs, uh, Christian doctrine, Christian institutions, and you dislodge the, to dislodge that, you need a rival hope, a rival belief, a rival beautiful vision of the future. And that took the word progress. People often talk about the march of progress. Pro progress is thing, something that just just keeps going on, and you can't stop it because it's progress, right? People speak about being on the right side of history. You've heard that. You want to be on the right side of history, which, of course, is irresistibly progressing. Don't be on the wrong side of history. It will not go well with you. History will judge you, capital H. Right? You've heard that. We've heard these things before. It's a kind of rival religion. There's history. Um, it has an arc. It has a moral progress. You can't, sta you, can't, you can't stop it. It's going for some reason. And uh, you don't want to be on the wrong side of it. Or, uh, yeah, it won't go well with you. What's that? Yeah, sinner against history. So, so people say, as I said, we've progressed since then. Well, what does that mean? We've progressed since then. I noticed the, uh, 
You know that beautiful Disney cartoon, Snow White? I haven't seen it in a while, you understand, but, but it was well done, and everyone loved it. 1937, and they recently redid Snow White. They, the entertainment industry, redid Snow White. Okay, uh, but they had to update it, right? And the actress who plays Snow White, I saw her on the news or on something, and of course she's a feminist, and uh, uh, she sort of eye-rolled and said, oh, it needs updating since 1937, because of course we've progressed since then. So uh, we can't be expected to uh, uh, appreciate this, this old thing. And President Obama, in his second term, not in his first term, in his second term, spoke of his views on same-sex marriage as having evolved, right? Evolved. Now he's, in, he's, he's more up to date with history. He's on the right side of that thing. So there's, there's a moral evolution that goes on historically as we become, what, more enlightened? Moral progress generally means that public morality, correct me if I'm wrong, public morality becomes more permissive of things that used to be seen as immoral or as socially destructive or even as perverted. Perverted means like deviating from nature. That's what perverted means. Um, <clears throat> so it's progress means the spread of enlightenment, which means an enlightenment means living by reason and science, and reason is pretty much reducible to science, uh, as opposed to religion and superstition. And religion is pretty much reduced to superstition. Uh, and these are viewed as mutually exclusive, religion on the one hand, science on the other and rationality. But it hasn't always been that way. It was only like in the late 19th century when religion and science came to be viewed as, as going in different directions. Before that, scientists were Christian people generally, and uh, it, it was an ex exploration not of God's word, but of God's works. So, uh, and yet today we're 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 told, oh no no, there's this there's there's exclusivity, and they go back to Galileo, and it's just been Galileo ever since. Um, but um, and by reason, as I said, uh, uh, reason is reduced to science, scientific reasoning. They don't mean like Aristotle's syllogistic reasoning, uh, logic, of this way. No, um, typically social science. Psychological science and evolutionary biology. Uh, this is this is this is how we live. So so I am a rational person, and so I consult the latest findings of social science or or psychological science or of uh, uh, evolutionary. What do they call it? Evolutionary psychology. Is that what it's called? And so forth. And so and so they people speak of uh, well studies have shown. Well, if you don't have a study to cite, like you can't say you know anything. Uh, you, you have an opinion, probably a, a, an unenlightened opinion, but, but uh, you don't have studies, studies to back it up, scientific studies. And, uh, and we're told to follow the science. Well, I'm going to follow the science on this. Well, that gives you authority, as opposed to, well, traditionally, <laughs> don't even talk to me. Well, the Bible says, oh, pff, oh eye roll, <laughs> head roll. Well, that's what you get. Um, but the problem is, it's a boast. Now, remember, what I, I think I, last time I was in the pulpit, I explained the difference between bragging and boasting. A brag is when you have something true to your credit, but you very rudely make a lot of it, Right? Um, a boast is when you have a little thing that's true and you make it into a big thing, much more than it is. So, so the notion of living by science 
is a boast because you can't do it. There may be a little science you're living by in some way, but the problem with living by science is that science can provide no moral guidance at all. It just, it just, it just, it's, it's like trying to hear a smell, right? Your ears can't grasp smells or, or, or to see a sound. You can't, your eyes can't grasp sound. And science, natural science of all different kinds, cannot grasp moral truth. There is moral truth, and science isn't, isn't the tool for grasping it. Science, when we think about what science is, science can tell you what is. It can't tell you about everything that is, uh, but it can tell you about some things that are. Science can uh, tell you what grass is, what, uh, what, what air is, what, what, what constitutes it, um, how it behaves. Um, it can also tell you what can be, right? So uh, science can tell you what air is. Air is compressible. Air is made up of, of various gases. Don't ask me which. I know oxygen's in there. And, 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 and depending on where you live, there's things you wish weren't there. Um, but uh, science uh, can, can tell you what can be done with air. You can compress it in a compressor and then use it to, to clean gunk off a surface. Am I right? Right? Compressed air. Or you can force it into a, 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 um, a rubber tire and then you can drive comfortably on that tire because it's full of air, which is compressible. I'm just layman stuff here. Uh, so it can tell you what can be done. And we went, we went through the, the plastics and the, and the bubbling crude, right? Um, this is oil. This is its composition. But this is what can be done with it. Uh, science can do that. But it can't tell you what ought to be done with it. What ought we do with air? What ought we do with What's that other stuff? Oil. What ought we, our bodies. It can tell you what a body is. It can tell you what you can do with a body to maybe make its life longer or make its life shorter. But it can't tell you how you ought to use your body or other people's bodies for that matter. Science is, is mute. It can, social science can tell you how people behave. It can tell you about voting patterns. It can tell you about, about uh, uh, teenagers, how they behave, um, uh, what causes them to behave that way. There's a mystery, right? But it can't tell you how they should behave, how people should behave, how little ones should behave, how old ones should behave. Nothing to say. So morally, in scientific society, post-Christian society, all we're left with is autonomy. Autonomy. That's on the next slide. There you go. Autonomy from the Greek autos and nomos. Nomos law, autos oneself. So it's a law that you give yourself, a law that comes out of yourself. Uh, you are in charge. You are sovereign. You are the source of judgments of right and wrong. Um, as as uh, I, think, I think Cindy said last week, um, your truth, right? This is, this is my truth. It's the truth I generated. It's the truth that I recognize for me. Autonomy. Uh, the philosophers, obviously 18th century philosophers, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Immanuel Kant, very big, taught us what freedom is for modern people. It's having no other law to live by but what you give yourself. So this didn't develop in the 60s. It goes back. Having no other law to live by what you give yourself. Uh, to live by a law that comes from neither God 
nor tradition, nor from nature. You're not guided by nature. How, how then shall I live? Well, what, what does nature teach? Um, what does natural law teach? Nope. Uh, well, h- how have we always lived? We Americans, we Athenians, we Romans, we Samoans. Uh, uh, nope. Uh, what does God say? Nope. What do I say? How about for me? It's a law from me to me. That's what autonomy is. And that's what we respect. And this sounds familiar to, to us. Um, again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Once it's pointed out, you go, oh, yeah, that's all around me. Yeah, that's through and through us. People admire this as authenticity. You're an authentic person if you live by your own rules. You give yourself your own idea of right and wrong. That's an authentic person. You're not living somebody else's truth. You're not living somebody else's uh, notions of right and wrong, but your own values. What do I value? These are my, and, and in schools, they'll tell children, don't just follow your parents' values and create your own values. <laughs> tell a little 10 year create my own values? And so where do they go for their values? YouTube. TikTok, they're friends. <laughs> it's, but anyway, yeah, this is what happens. But um, now you're wondering, well, this is Sunday school. Shouldn't there be scripture? Where do we see this sort of thing in the Bible? Garden of Eden, yeah. This is exactly how Satan tempted Eve. You will know good and evil. God doesn't want you doing that. God wants to be in charge. You can be in charge of you. And you will be if you eat of this fruit of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God has very selfishly or wickedly or something uh, denied you. And this knowledge of good and evil is, is, a, is, is basically autonomy. You will decide good and evil yourself. Pardon me? Oh, what do you have in mind? Yeah, there was no king in Israel in the book of Judges, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What chaos. And you read, you're reading the book of Judges, you go, oh my goodness, <laughs> what is wrong with these people? <laughs> Madness. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a pretty sight. And so... So where does it end? I, 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 this self-directed self-assertion ends in not a society of philosophers. Right? Every man, every woman a philosopher, uh, uh, a, 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 an Olympian self-determiner. No, feelings. It all comes down to feelings, as usual. <laughs> People living by their feelings, because after all, autonomy like, why rational autonomy? That's kind of random, right? Why reason? Why not unreason? <laughs> Nietzsche, uh, the late 19th century nihilistic philosopher, says, you know, why, why truth? Why not untruth? Why reason? Why not unreason? Uh, why not my feelings? That's the way I like to, that's the way most people, uh, given this. Why reason? Reason is hard, rigorous. Disciplined reasoning, very difficult. But feelings are right there, <laughs> and they're very flattering. Yeah. And people boast about being pragmatic. Well, you know, you have your principles, right? I'm pragmatic. I just do. Pragma- pragmatism means doing what works. But works for what? Works me- means works for something. Uh, works to to make something happen or to gain something more effectively or efficiently, right? Um, certainly not works for Christian morality. Why, why Christian morality? We've, we've seen through that. But in the end, what it works for is your feelings, what you desire, 
what your appetites want, uh, what makes you feel good, what makes you feel good about yourself. That's what it comes down to. But the modern hope, this modern hope, we mentioned that last day, is parasitical on Christian morality without realizing it or without admitting it. But separate, you take Christian morality and you separate it from its Christian foundation, from its biblical foundation, from its foundation in Christ, the risen Christ, and all you're left with is a kind of holdover residue of Christian morality that people take for granted. But it's just a residue, and it's holdover. If you, you know the, the expression running on fumes. <clears throat> when we took off this morning, I, I said, ha, ah, we're low on gas. <laughs> well, we'll make it to church, <laughs> and we'll get it at the, uh, at the Circle K up, 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 up there, as good a price as you're going to get these days, and, uh, and we'll get it there. On, on the, we'll be okay. We won't be running on fumes. Right? <laughs> the gas tank is empty, and there's just a kind of <laughs> smell that's still left in there. <laughs> and somehow the, those poor spark plugs, which do their best, God, blo God bless them, <laughs> are trying to spark as best they can. Yeah, that's, that's us. Uh, on the, the fumes of, of Christian civilization, Christian morality, Christian culture, Christian heritage. And so last week we saw, we saw poor old Richard Dawkins, who's been making war against stupid Christianity and religion, which poisons everything and, and deludes people and so forth. And now he's sitting here in, in oh my, post-Christian Britain going, this is horrible. That Christian culture was not such a bad thing. And, but he still doesn't want Christianity, just Christian culture, as if you can have one without the other. So leaving, leaving Christian behind and going post-Christian leaves you with feelings, appetites, if not Islam and Satanism. Uh, and it's interesting, the Satanism is, is, uh, is that progressive, science-based view of the world with an inexplicable religious overlay, but satanic. Uh, still in rebellion, and according to them, still in rebellion against religion and so forth, but why Satan? But what we're, we're left with in practical terms is, is this appetite and, and feelings. And the thing is, <coughs> when we're all just left to pursue our appetites and our feelings and what we want, what, what you get in practice is the dominance of the strong over the weak. Because the strong are in a position, a better position to satisfy their appetites than the weak are. And they don't care about the weak. <clears throat> I think of myself as a guy who's had his eyes open in the world and, you know, knows a thing or two and how the world works. But like recently, <coughs> pardon me, recently I've seen like the horrible stuff that goes on amongst the elites, the Hollywood and entertainment elite, particularly regarding child stars. They didn't stand a chance. Poor Justin Bieber didn't stand a chance. And, and, and th this, 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 oh. And, <coughs> but the Hollywood elites, Music industry elites, fashion industry. These apparently these photographers, high-end photographers in the fashion industry, they're just predators. And they go into this so they can be predators. And the politicians, 
we've heard about P. Diddy and Jeffrey Epstein and, uh, and all the celebrities and the power people that they bring into their soirees and, uh, shall we say, and, and then they get dirt on them and then they control them. And this is just like all over the place. Okay, this is what powerful people do. And, and, and uh, <coughs> I was talking to my son this week. Uh, he talked about a, 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 a restaurant opportunity he's heard about in, this, in the Northeast. And you know, millionaires and billionaires go there. And, and I said, watch it. Millionaires and billionaires generally look at people like you as entirely consumable. They will say, I can give you opportunities. I can advance you. I can. They want to consume you in the wor even in the worst possible ways. Right? <clears throat> this is post-Christian society. It's appetite which empowers the, uh, the, the, most, the most privileged and, and talented and uh, <clears throat> Well placed, the strong over the weak. Um, so again, an ugly picture. And what do you and what do you get when you have people living by their appetites, um, their passions, their impulses? When that's what everything is based on. Something between savage and insane. Okay. Hardly the age of reason. We were promised. <clears throat> and so you have, like in the last few years, this celebration of LGBTQ this, that, and the other thing. Uh, drag queens, for goodness sakes. And, and, and it's not just, well, we're, we're, we'll make a safe space for them, like for everyone. No, no, they're celebrated. And you're condemned if you don't celebrate them because they are exercising their freedom in an authentic way, whereas you're still you know, following tradition and religion and, and other people's morality. Uh, so this is where we end up. <clears throat> the substitute gospel was billed as a better hope, and it is a gospel, as, as I explained last day. Uh, the empire of reason over nature, the empire of man over the universe. Be still my heart. Liberation from the forces of nature. And as I said, we, we, we enjoyed that liberation from the forces of nature. You know, it's a really bad storm. You still come to church because you can. You don't say, oh, storming, I can't go out because there's a storm that is limiting what I can do. Nope. I mean, it would have to be a hurricane. We still haven't licked the hurricanes and the tornadoes. But, uh, but everything short of that, it's like, okay, whatever. You get in your car, drive there, you come in here, everything's nice. Liberation from the forces of nature. And with the goal, the project was with a goal not to the glory of God, with the goal of not to um, the advance of the gospel, the more, the more rapid advance of the gospel across the world, but comfort and security. These were the, the, the original architects of this, people like Francis Bacon and uh, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and people like this. Comfort and security. <clears throat> Which aren't bad things, right? God wants this. So this is why he said, take dominion over the earth. Unpack my creation and all the glories of the creation and, and the good things that come out of the creation. Uh, uh, you know, cultivate the ground and have wheat and barley and flax and, and, and uh, make wine and beer and, and uh, all manner of bread. Don't get me started <laughs> on bread. Simple bread. I mean, you can go from there. <laughs> bread. God wants us to discover rye bread and sourdough and focaccia and bagels and, and whatever it is the Scots eat. Uh, <laughs> unmentionable things the Scots eat. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, uh, 
Yeah, so, so comfort and security, good. Uh, but it's, it's not only liberation. We were promised not only liberation from sickness and storm uh, and from the merciless control of other people. Like political science has advanced. So that now we have modern republicanism. And so if we hold to it, we're no longer like governed by arbitrary whims of powerful people, uh, but they're accountable to the broad mass of the, of, of the population. And there's checks and balances in place. And, and, and I could go on, and which gives us stable, secure, decent government. This is a modern innovation. But also, we get liberation from tradition and liberation from religious authority, the church. But even from religion itself and from any moral standards, from any source other than oneself, one thing leads to another, has led to another, and it was intended to. So <clears throat> the modern free person, somebody who is free in the uniquely modern way, takes nothing from nature, nothing from the way the world is, nothing from the creation order of the world. Well, what did, what did God intend these things to be used for? Um, body parts. Well, you can see from looking at them, they have a certain design. Uh, they have a certain uh, intention, natural, divinely intended purpose. Uh, I'm sorry, what is that to me? I'll do whatever I want with these things, right? they say. Uh, because I'm free in this uniquely modern way. And so you have the sexual revolution. Do we all agree just how profound the sexual revolution was and continues to be? I mean, it's, it's, it overturns civilization. At first, it was like, well, you know what it was at first in the 50s is when it started, I think, um, and then really took off in the 60s. You know, hippies, you know, and yeah, communes, thank you. Let's call it communes. <laughs> Uh, and then it went from like Stonewall Bar in New York and this lib and that lib and, uh, and now it's like public school, transgenderism, gender is, is conventional, sex is biological, but there is a whole spectrum of genders. And, and if you're in a school and, and children are exercising their choice to be whatever they want to be, and everyone is like what they were when they were randomly assigned something at birth, so they say, uh, then as a teacher, you're not doing your job. As a school, you're not doing your job. You're not making them aware of the options that are humanly available to them. And so you're leaving them in oppression and frustration, and they'll probably commit suicide. Oh, no. And so you need to get those numbers up of, of people jumping from one to another um, to show that they're free and unsuppressed. Uh, and so they bring in <coughs> lessons. <coughs> they bring in special speakers. Um, and so forth. And, and, and really, why wouldn't they? It's, it's, it's a logical outworking of the premises. Once you accept the sexual revolution, it just stage by stage unfolds. And you're really, if you don't go there, you're really arbitrarily drawing a line and imposing your dis moral discomfort on other people. <coughs> the problem is, is the original premise, though. You depart from Christian revelation, Christian civilization, and there's no stopping the conclusion <coughs> that this is the problem over here. The, depart for, the uh, departure from 
from the truth. <clears throat> but it all has a sad ending, as I think, as, as I think I've, I've argued. There's a sad empty ending to this empty sky. You know, John Lennon, we g I gave you John Lennon. Uh, oh, what a beautiful world. No hell below us, above us only sky. Uh, nothing to uh, live or die for. Everyone living for today. Just, and uh, the world will live in peace. And uh, I'm a rock star, so why wouldn't you believe me? And the, what I call the deep, cold space of human possibility. Previous slide, please. Yeah. See, what, uh, uh, Buzz, <coughs> Buzz Spacebar is uh, looking out at the endless, limitless human possibilities and going, you know, he's, if he had breath, he'd be breathless. And... And it's scary. It's just like empty, cold, nothingness. And this is good news? Well, you can fill it with whatever you want. <coughs> I'm with Woody. Um, I think he sees further than Buzz does. <coughs> what happens is not rational, universal rational enlightenment but the empire, not of man over the universe, but of appetite and impulse. This is, uh, and ultimately the empire of some people over other people, but more profoundly than before. Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, that French aristocrat who came over to America in the 1830s and 40s and uh, looked around with his brilliant analytical mind and wrote Democracy in America, this beautiful big thick book. And he called, so he, he referred to soft despotism. Uh, he was talking about government um, given responsibility for everything and uh, providing, providing, providing. Uh, it's, des it's despotic, but it's soft despotism. It makes life comfortable, right? You're in chains. But you don't notice the chains because you love their benefits. Right? And it, that's something like the success of the modern scientific, progressive, secular project. It ends not in, I argue, uh, not in freedom, 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 but uh, a, a more profound slavery, an enslavement to the appetites. Um, that tries to protect you from its bitter consequences. But bitter consequences there are. Um, so <clears throat> my argument is that the post-Christian gospel has over-promised and under-delivered. On the one hand, genuinely wonderful technologies for which we're grateful, uh, wonderful comforts for which we're grateful, um, unprecedented personal security and, and uh, civil peace, at least so far. Um, and yet we modern beneficiaries of all these things that are so comfortable and so secure live with restless anxiety. And I'm not the first to notice this. Restless anxiety. Right? Endless therapy. Really, in, in the modern world, why is anyone depressed? You've got, you've got all the, the comforts and conveniences. You have dazzling entertainments, even right here. And, and if anything goes wrong, there's, there's, there's chemical therapies. But why should anything go wrong? That's not part of the deal. And yet, everyone. And, and, and <clears throat> I'm told in those sort of uh, uh, Gold Coast, Manhattan, hedge fund, people world, uh, they all have therapists. <laughs> and they're divorcing. And, and they're miserable. And horribly insecure. And 
that's what those in, some of the ins, insiders tell me. Why? Yeah, why? But there it is. And a constant search for new and ever better gospels. And despite living longer lives, the certainty of death as usual. <laughs> oh, death's still there. <laughs> I just saw Clint Eastwood. Uh, a pe well, not personally, uh, but, uh, but he's 94 years old. Oh, my watch is slow. I think I'm getting home. It's actually quarter after, isn't it? Oh. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah, Clint Eastwood, he's very old. He's 94. Uh, but, uh, yeah, his days are numbered too. Anyway, so, uh, so what is, do we just close with this? What is the alternative to personal autonomy? What do you embrace as the alternative to personal autonomy? Why would you be against personal autonomy? Do you have something better? What you, that, was, that was too much. So we're created to bring glory to God. So we're created by a God who knows us better than we know ourselves, knows our good, tells us what that good is, and says, obey me. Like the way parents say, obey me, right? <laughs> Don't drink the Drano, right? <laughs> But it's not, don't drink the Dano. I, no, I don't have to explain this to you, but I could. <laughs> right? And you're happy because you're not drinking the Drano. Yeah. In fact, love one another. <laughs> love one another and, and love me. <laughs> what could go wrong? Nothing. Anyway. So it's, it's the old news. It's still the good news. Anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for <clears throat> your word, for the clarity of your word, for the goodness of your word, because you are good, and you made us and said it was very good. Father, we pray that uh, you would continue to open our eyes and give us voice uh, for those who need to know these things, and open their ears and turn us back. In Jesus' name we ask it, amen. I'm sorry my watch was slow. I should have seen the crowds.